Hello, everybody. You know, the thing I wish for us all here is when we are gone, our uh, life to be so harmonic to the ears of the other people that are behind, that are le left behind. So, um, if my mother was here, she would tell you that I'm attention seeking. I am not really. Well, <laughs> part of it is. Um, she would be sure I couldn't convince her. So, um, I am not actually. I, I decided to give up one of my most important points of references, which is my sight. Um, somebody who um, thinks in images, who describes things in images. When people talk to me, I make a film in my head. I mean, the best way to make my brain beautiful is to Photoshop it. And, um, and so, um, I gave it up. I gave a, a, part of, a part of my control, actually, so that to explain, in a way, or to feel the vulnerability that I feel, because I don't even know if I'm turned your way. I can, I can, I can understand a bit that I'm turned almost in the middle. And um, the vulnerability that somebody could feel when we announce to them that their life is ending or that um, they have a fatal illness. They lose, and their families, they lose every point of reference and they lose all control. All they've dreamt of, all they've um, they wanted to do, all they were postponing is, is finished. It has to happen now or uh, cannot happen. There is all sorts of feelings and we've described them in books everywhere and you probably know them. And, um, and I put on the mask actually to see just a small percentage of how it, it is to be vulnerable in front of everybody. Um, now I can see you a bit. In, uh, in working with dying patients, actually, the most difficult thing was that I didn't know anything every day. So I chose a subject today, which is fear of living and fear of dying. And uh, I realized, actually, 10 days ago, that I know nothing about it. I wrote about three notebooks full of notes, thinking, uh, reading stuff I wrote in the past, looking up patient files. But I, I couldn't understand how to explain to people what it is uh, to be fearing living and fearing dying. Firstly, I want to clear something out. I don't think that anybody really fears to die. What everybody fears is to lose complete control and not to know, not to know what's going to happen next, not to be in, in full control or at least uh, as much control as he can with his life and with uh, his body and with the people around him. So I thought of starting with a small story. And uh, the small story starts in palliative care. Palliative care is a, is a place where people come when they cannot take curative care anymore, so they cannot be healed, but we can give them quality of life through uh, different therapies. And uh, some 10, 15 years ago, I don't remember, I met this uh, lady who was around 50. She had 30 years in, uh, in the UK with her husband. She was always dreaming of the moment to come back home and uh, they did come back home after 30 years. They went to their uh, village where they left from and uh, built a small house and they could live their life as they dreamt of it. And uh, one day, like nine or 10 months later, she was diagnosed with, uh, with cancer and uh, she came into oncology. We could not we could not heal her with, uh, with the therapies we gave, so I met her in palliative care when she was crippled and dying. We were uh, spending enough time every day talking about her life and about what she was going to miss out and how she dreamt about it. And uh, one day I asked, when she was really very ill, if there was something she was longing for. <laughs> I told you, I think, in images, so I have all the images, actually. And uh, she said, yes, I would like to go home, sit on my sofa, 
have all the neighbors I love and all the friends I have that used to come in the morning and have coffee with me, like my mother used to do before I left England, do that for a few hours and come back. Okay, I said, we'll do that. So I go to my team, the oncologist and the nurses and the family, and I say that Mrs. P wants to go home. Well, she has to do it tomorrow because she's not doing very well. And everybody was looking at me like if I was completely nuts. And probably I was completely nuts uh, because I didn't know if she would be alive until the next day. Anyways, they started with their what if and um, but, and everybody was really very scared, although it was her decision. So uh, we had to inform the lady. The lady was informed and she said, you know what, if it's not making a lot of pain, if it's not causing a lot of pain to my husband and children, I would like to do it. So the husband and children said, okay, if you want to do it, you're going to do it. So we put her on an, in an ambulance. I remember Yorgos from the ambulance was looking at me like, oh man, yo, you're over your limits here. But anyways, he took her in. Uh, he took her to her house where she spent lots of hours with her friends. I think I walked around 100 kilometers a day in agony, actually, of the blames I could be uh, listening to or even get fired. And uh, she came back. I ran to the ambulance and uh, we opened the door and she was alive. So she was very pale and she was very tired. She gave me a thumbs up like this. She couldn't talk anymore. She went to her bed and died three or four hours later. So I was wondering when I was trying to think of fear of living on fear of dying, what this woman has done and many other patients that I know. And this woman had, uh, had managed to create life under the threatening eyes of death. She decided that she could be vulnerable. She decided that she could feel fear. She decided that she could take any risk actually because what she really longed in her heart to go from being a patient in a bed and dying in our very organized and beautiful ways of morphine and uh, ways of not understanding what you're doing actually and you don't suffer or at least that's what we think, uh, to creating life even with the last hours of her life. And uh, I am saying that because when we lose everything, we see, not very often, but we see that we can create something that up to now we did not believe that we could do. We go over our limits, even when there's a, uh, a war, I'm sorry, I, I think in French as well, so some words might be a bit crazy. I'll, 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 and if I understand, I'll change them. So um, when there's a, a great catastrophe actually, when we lose somebody, we think that if we lose, we can't live any, anymore. And um, when you read the books about the people who work like us in, in, in end-of-life services, many books will tell you that people die in beautiful ways. Well, it's a lie. People do not die in beautiful ways. Mrs. P was one of a small percentage of people that managed to create life when everything is being lost. And this kind of people that create life when everything is lost is the kind of people that manage actually to let go. They manage to go through a very painful procedure that today we call grief and uh, to feel responsible for the blame, for the shame, for the guilt, to forgive themselves for the postponings they've done in their lives, to accept that they can let go of situations and people that they love. And then when they go through this procedure, they are free to create things that they have really very deep down in their hearts. So I wondered, why do we write books that lie about these people? Okay. And then, wondering about that, I wondered why do we have magazines everywhere that show perfect bodies and uh, lovely families? And why do we talk about the five steps to happiness and the three steps to uh, public speaking? And um, I realized actually that what is very vulnerable in us, like I felt when I put my mask, cannot like, we cannot like to feel it. We don't like to feel vulnerable. We don't like to feel 
fearful. We don't like to lose control of things. We have a sort of beast inside us that has been created since we were small kids, actually, of all the lacks of, uh, of love or uh, care or, or whatever, or abandonments that we, we thought we, we were needing at the time. And it became like a guardian of you won't be hurt again, okay? And this beast is somewhere inside. It wakes up at moments, you can feel it. It wakes up when you get really confused in the head and you don't know what to do and, 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 and every decision seems so scary. So, um, so this beast is, is somewhere inside and there is the mind, the mind, the king of today's world. So uh, that has managed to control many things and to know everything and to think that this evolution that is happening in the world can save us from everything, okay? The mind that doesn't like losing anything. We are a society of keeping, of not losing information. We have iClouds, we have zip files, we have uh, photos, millions of photos that we will never be able to look back onto. Things we wrote that we never, we'll never probably have the time. We keep people alive, sometimes, really, so as not to lose. We keep them in old people's home. We rarely go see them, or if we go see them, you know, it's difficult. We lose stuff from what we do every day. So we write all these things about the people, I think, and the, and the doctors, when I wanted Mrs. P or other people that I wanted to follow their dream, uh, is that we lose control. And we want to make sure that the mind will keep us in control about everything, even when we are dying. So we, we don't need to worry, okay? Our mind will have control and people know and science knows and medication will be there for us and we won't have to touch again the vulnerable part within, which is that beast that if it wakes up actually, it confuses the mind, we lose control we don't know what to do anymore. We go to counselors, we go onto the internet, we see what people do under panic attacks, we see what people do when something bad is, uh, is announced, but we forget to feel. We forget to be present in what's happening there. Le fear of leaving is actually to continue doing the exact same things, the exact same patterns in your relationships, in your everyday life, in, uh, in, uh, in, in how you, uh, you deal with your dreams and your anxiety, repeating the same ways, the same methods, the same roles every single day so as not to make a change and to feel that you have control with your mind. This is fear of living, not to be able to take the risk to feel something differently, not to be able to take the risk to stand vulnerable in front of other people, to stand fearful and to know that you can't do anything about it. And you need to make peace with that that is happening within you, your body that is shaking and your image that is being completely blown away and you don't look the beautiful guy you looked up to there or the good father or the strong mother or uh, the professional that always knows because we are human beings and we don't know all the time and we can't do all the time and we are all very fearful about situations and, but we think that our mind will keep us in control forever but it won't because there will be events in our lives that they will make the beast wake up and when the beast wakes up we will be lost and there would be times maybe that we won't be able to run for solutions or there would not be people to tell us A, B, C, D, E to put our mind back into an organization and feel that we have control. Uh, so what for me is living, is it is taking risks. Living for me is a sort of a rhythm. It's like, it's like the beautiful piece of music you've heard. Life, to me, has only one purpose, to make itself realize, realize itself into us. It's to make her rhythm actually be felt by us, is to create new is to be in front of a situation that you don't know how to deal with and just stay with what you feel and let's see what will come next. It's not to organize, it's not to project, it's not to blame, 
it's not to gossip, it's not things that we will do to a point, but it's to stay with the dreadful feelings that we can have as people that would make us feel vulnerable and create feeling those feelings and accepting to be human for as long as it takes. Thank you very much. I wish you. Thank you, really thank you. It's got another two minutes, and because I said thank you. No, 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 I was gonna leave, but, but now I like it here. So, <laughs> my mind has control over everything now. Um, saying thank you, I wanna leave you with another beautiful story. It's a story of a young girl, Angela, who died when she was 19 years old. And one summer, she went to the doctor in England and told her after two years that she was struggling, taking therapies and uh, doing everything for uh, keeping healthy. He told her, uh, as I phrase it to you, she told, it's your last summer, enjoy it. So she's 19, she comes back and she decides that she will take his advice and enjoy it. I have never seen somebody not sleep for so many days. She was, she was driving and she had a bottle of oxygen in her car in case her lung metastasis would give her a crisis and she would need oxygen. So, when she died, her mother asked me to talk at her funeral and say a few words about her. We were very close. We, we were together until the, the last second. I mean, we were together until the end, or that's what we call the end. And, um, and I took the exercise books in which she was writing the last months, okay? And I opened them, and I was extremely surprised because everything started with a thank you. Thank you that the nurse today was the one that doesn't hurt me when she takes blood. Thank you that I woke up and the sky has different colors. All the things that the last months of her life I never noticed, even once, because I was very busy doing things and projecting myself and building a life to live it later. That's what I want to leave you with. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>